Hello everyone. It's the um, continuation of my uh, lectures on uh, enacted and process-based um, theology in Wicca. Um, Alfred Whitehead, uh, who is the uh, uh, most uh, prominent uh, process, uh, process theologian, um, in his theology, God is involved and active in the becomingness of the world. His discussion of concrete human experience and interaction as foundational to a theological understanding of reality uh, fits very well with the Wiccan theology. Um, he sees um, it as necessary for uh, there to be uh, consciousness active in and of the universe, that consciousness is not a, an incidental <coughs> but is uh, a foundational um, aspect of, of the universe. And he extends uh, consciousness uh, quite a bit more broadly than uh, simply uh, human animals um, or others like us or deities uh, to uh, uh, other physical uh, objects or beings. Um, uh, Grig, uh, Grig's feminist uh, theology of enactment um, in which, quote, a relation enacted between the self and nature, other selves, and the power of being is something very real and something more than the sum of its constituent elements. Indeed, this relation is the divine, quote, uh, extends Whitehead um, and talks about um, relationship as foundational, that uh, direct engagement between self and other is the uh, means through which uh, divinity is created and expressed um, in the world. It doesn't exist outside of the uh, relationships and um, uh, that that uh, are constitutive of uh, our lives and of the functioning of the universe as a whole. Uh, Greg fits very well with uh, performance theories of religion. And, and ritual, particularly uh, Catherine Bell, whose work I love, and the ritual embodiment ideas of, of Sordis. Uh, Sordis uh, has, quote, a methodological standpoint in which bodily experience is understood to be the existential ground of culture and self, and therefore a valuable starting point for their analysis, quote. Um, in other words, uh, rather than uh, taking the mind-body split and saying that the mind is all that matters, uh, Sordis begins with the body and says that by acting and being and performing, we uh, in part create the mind and can create our, our spiritual and religious uh, lives. Um, it's the emphasis on uh, ritual and creation uh, that's important here, not things are not handed to us, we uh, engage in the world, engage in relationship, and, and co-create um, the foundation uh, circumstances in which our spiritual lives uh, come to exist. Uh, Greg's enactment theologies worship and ritual in the context of commitment to the enacted goddess um, is as a sense of participation in the divine. One does not stand apart from God, but it was taken up into the divine life and purpose in the larger reality of the relation that is goddess. And this is very similar to Wiccan understandings. Um, community and ritual is centrally important to enactment theology. There is a renewal of the self and of community through ritual. Um, ritual is less doctrinal and more imagistic, stimulating reflection on the nature of goddess and the way of existence she prefers, but crucially, not providing binary options. Uh, Sean Wilson's discussion of the indigenous research methodology also uh, is insightful um, here. The shared aspect of indigenous ontology and epistemology is relationality. Relationships do not merely shape reality, they are reality. The shared aspect of an indigenous axiology and methodology is this accountability to relationships. Now, uh, Wilson is speaking here to, uh, purely in terms of, uh, of 
developing an indigenous uh, research methodology and um, academic approach that I think his, uh, his ideas extend uh, more broadly. Greg uh, captures a sense of emergent divinity enacted in relationships and human processes, which is some long way towards a useful um, ecclesiology for Wicca, a theology of, uh, of groups. Uh, he presents a systematic and effective formal, uh, formally consistent reading through various feminist theologians, uh, Rosemary Ruder, Carol Christ, Judith Plasco, Mary Daly, and important non-feminist theologians and thinkers like uh, Paul Tillich, Martin Buber, Immanuel Kant, and William James, where they are useful, and sticks pretty firmly to a functionalist approach. Um, Greg sees a common thread in uh, feminist theology. The divine is a relationship that human beings decide to enact, and develops his argument around this relationship and the issues that it implies. Uh, imminent and transcendent aspects of deity, uh, dependence or independence of goddess and humanity, the necessity of engagement with the other to create oneself and to create the divine in our encounters, and other issues around enactment, uh, sincerity, experience, and meaning creation. Like I said, uh, his, his desire to rescue monotheism from the logic of his argument mars an otherwise quite excellent discussion, and his lack of occultist training, which is still a significant part of the Wiccan worldview, limits his applicability uh, for our purposes. Um, but uh, nonetheless, uh, that's why I make you read them. A few days ago, I talked a little bit about uh, Carol Christ's process theology, um, which owes a great deal to Charles Hartswine. Uh, Christ opts for a personal goddess of love and good, understanding her as being, quote, the intelligent embodied love that is in all being, a personal presence who cares about the world, quote, as her theological starting point. Beginning with the body and the world as the body of the, uh, God in, in physical and material terms, uh, Christ affirms change and embodiment, touch and relationship, power with, not power over, the world as co-created, this life rather than hope for another, and the fragmentariness of all knowledge, and arrives at a theological position which is very compatible with Wicca. Uh, however, Christ's uh, theology has a weak ecclesiology and her egg uh, because of her anti-hierarchic bias, which militates against privileging one set of connections over another uh, or the creation of strong groups. Uh, Constance Wise um, uses Alfred Whitehead's process theology to examine Wiccan ritual and, and occultism, and it also points towards an emergent uh, theology. Wiccan epistemology could be framed as follows. Human knowledge arises from a root sense, which humans share with all beings, of existing in relation to all events and to the whole of a process of the universe. Human perceptions and interpretations of the world obscure this core knowledge, but we have access to it through our bodies. Through ritual, it can be raised, however briefly and faintly, to conscious awareness. And that's from her article, A Process Epistemology of Wiccan Occult Knowledge uh, in the Pomegranate, 2004. Potentials are collecting in society in general and in religious movements and organizations in specific and we can uh, uh, anticipate a phase shift. Uh, what emergent phenomena will be realized, however? Is there a teleology, an end point to which the universe is tending, or are these shifts purely adaptive, uh, due to be superseded in their turn by other adaptations to changing circumstances and increased uh, complexity? I'm led to think more critically about the reductionist uh, perspective and to engage more deeply with the systems and emergent uh, perspective. The reductionist assumption that to find what is real, we need to cut experience <coughs> into the smallest components and look at each component in isolation is a model of discovering one part of the truth of things. By doing this, however, we lo lose the emerging uh, 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 properties of complex systems like consciousness and subjective experience, the emotional value of touch, and the sensual pleasures <coughs> which give texture to our lives. Scientific method, which is reductionist, 
removes the observer from the observation, <coughs> which is very powerful in its area. But it is a mistake to confuse a methodology with a conclusion about the nature of reality. The word objective has come to me equated with true, while the word subjective is untrue, but a purely objective account of the world, a world devoid of subjects, is necessarily an incomplete account of the world, which does not account for a key property of emergence, which is consciousness. By reducing truth to fact, we lose experience and our subjective reality. By removing ourselves from nature methodologically, we can believe that we're not a part of nature ontologically. Reality is connection, embeddedness in a web of relations and significance. We can't abstract human beings out of religious experience, and we can't build a theology that is not rooted in those experiences in community with the goddesses and gods in communion. By following a reductionist path, trying to abstract away the uh, special details of the divine encounter, we find the lowest common denominator, and there's no gods there. Neither is there anything else that makes life worth living. There is no joy, there is no love, there is no passion, there is no nuance, there is nothing human. Subjectivity is not just about aesthetics. It is the emerging property of complex physical systems, of engagement, experience, consciousness. It's an entire dimension overlooked by purely objective uh, accounts of the world. By marrying Greg's enactment theology with the occultist idea of the egregore, the collective group mind, an autonomous physic psychic entity made up of and influencing the thoughts of a group of people, we have a foundation to a Wiccan ecclesiology. The egregore, which is created by any group of people who are intensely involved with each other, uh, usually dissipates when the group dissolves. It begins as a reservoir of power, a focus of the shared purpose of the group, a creative process, and an amplifier of prayer at the early stage when it is consciously or spontaneously created, fed, and reinforced. Wiccan covens create this entity from the group mind that emerges in their activities. Naming and investing it with personal characteristics, feeding and worshiping, transforms it from a tool into a partner with the group members and an actor in the world which expresses the ideas and spiritual goals of that group. In the religion of Vudun, uh, voodoo, it's common for notable individuals to become uh, deities, uh, loa, after their deaths. Their souls are called, worshipped, fed, and invoked into the bodies of priestesses and priests, and asked to help their worshippers. Voodoo practice and uh, theology is a valuable source for developing Wiccan ecclesiology because of similarities between the two religions. Again, it's a, it's a distant cousin uh, of Wicca, but, uh, but we can learn from, uh, from its, how it has developed. Um, the egregore, through conscious um, effort of will, can be made stronger, can be fed, and become more powerfully present in the lives of people involved in groups, and can outlive its founders although it remains attached, in general, to the groups that are descended from them. Wiccans participate in the divine. We co-create the gods by expressing them, not apart from, but swept into, those divine purposes. A well-documented egregore, that I'll refer you to, was an experiment by the Toronto Psychic Society. The conscious creation of a ghost of a man who never lived. A group came together every week to communicate with a ghost, which they knew they had invented, and he came, which resulted in psychic phenomena of the classic types. They wrote a fictional portrait. They made it as real as they could, while remaining completely aware that it was fiction. Um, the book uh, Conjuring Up Philip, an Adventure in Psychokinesis uh, by Iris Owen uh, documents this, uh, this experiment. And it's quite a fascinating piece of work. Um, gods of agriculture, for example, uh, came into existence at the same time as agriculture did, grew out of the spirit and developed jointly as it developed, with both human and divine efforts working in tandem, prodding and shaping it. Deities and guardian spirits come into being whenever any group of people working together consistently on some project. 
um, are involved with one another and identify with one another. The common experience of a group mind, when a wonderful coordination of effort and thought strikes a group of people and they are suddenly doing the same thing toward a common goal at a high level of feeling and effectiveness, is an example of the creation of an egregore. This creative process, unconscious as it usually is, will be erratic, short-lived, and weak in effect, with the people involved having widely different views of what they are doing and why, and donating very small amounts of energy to it. A guardian spirit may be slow to emerge and very weakly defined or experienced. Those few who are conscious of what's going on and who do forcefully concentrate and shape the flow of energy and emotion can have an effect out of all proportion to their numbers for this, for this reason. Now, groups that consciously choose to create on the spiritual level together and exercise <coughs> their creative, emotional, and spiritual force towards the ends of shaping and worshiping deity can have a very strong and clear effect. A guardian that expresses and enhances their personal spiritual power, hopes, and capacity for wonder over a lifetime or longer. An egregore ecclesiology sees the gods as created through and reinforcing the identity of the group, drawing energy from its members and feeding back energy to those people or activities that most closely express its developing and deeping, deepening uh, purposes. Choosing the characteristics of the developing uh, goddess or god and consciously shaping her expression to suit the vision of the group will create a structure, leadership style, ritual style, and sacred stories, all of which are mutually reinforcing, which advises care, particularly at the early stages of a congregation or temple, in the types of expression and whom one chooses to invite and deepen one's connection with. Action in accord with a clear vision, when actions are congruent with vision, a congregation will strengthen the egregore in the direction of empowering that vision. Regardless of the ostensible vision, the egregore will be shaped by what people put energy into and how they express that shared spirituality. Now, what does this mean for ecclesiology? That the structures chosen for a church, style of worship, choice of leadership, religious education program, uh, the style of instruction, but also the central uh, sacred stories that you choose, and actions and mission in the world must reflect the same vision. The gods shaped through collaboration will in turn shape the church, and it will become stronger and more effective in congruence with these choices. When we understand that the gods are co-created, made real through the belief and practice of the human community, uh, enacted, as we use Greg's term, in a co collaborative relationship between humans and gods in a context of human needs and relationships, this doesn't make them fictional, simply projections from our minds. If they were only this, then their effects would still be useful, but they would just be tools, and they wouldn't be beings with whom we can have working relationships. The expression of the divine potential saturating the universe is always contingent on the circumstances through which it is expressed and the needs and desires of the people to and through whom it is expressed. There is no valid truth claim for the divine outside of personal experience. The gods of an egregore theology do make demands and do have expectations. They make these on the people who participate in their creation and the organizations which embody them. But they also provide specific rewards and increased efficacy to those people. By centering religion on experience and community, we participate in the divine. We co-create the gods, or at least we express them through our lives, not apart from, but swept into these divine purposes.